Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You ever heard the name James Marshall? He was the first in a long line of one of the most significant events in the history of our country. He was the first to discover gold in California. The year was 1848, and those that followed him were called the 49ers. And they, the California gold rush brought people from all over to the hills and mountains of California seeking their fame and their fortune. And they even came up with a term for it. Do you remember what it was? Eureka, which means I found it. But then some of them discovered that it wasn't as easy as they thought because they would work for days, months, digging out this gold and put it into buckets and bags and take it into the town only to find out it was worthless because it wasn't real gold. It was fool's gold or iron pyrite, and it looks so good. And they had to learn that not everything in the hillside or in the riverbed that glitters was good. And they had to come up with some tests. You know, the experienced miner could usually look at iron pyrite and gold and determine which was which and what was real, but, but they also had to sometimes test it you remember what their tests were? You've seen it in movies. Take the nugget of gold and bite it. You know why? Because gold is softer than the human tooth. And so it would dent, and they would know it was gold. And iron pyrite, on the other hand, is harder and probably break your tooth. But that wasn't always an effective way. So they also discovered that if you take a white stone, like a piece of ceramic, and you take a gold nugget and you rub across it, it leaves a yellow streak. But if you take a piece of iron pyrite and rub across it, it leaves a, a greenish brown, black streak. And they could determine with a test what was real and good and what was false and bad. And that was important because their very futures depended on it, being able to discern what was true and what was not true. We find ourselves as God's people in the midst of a world where we need to be discerning. Because while we have the truth, there's a lot of things out there that are not true. This is the eighth sermon in our series out of 1 John that I titled Unshakable because God wants us to be able to stand on solid ground, to be immovable in the truth, the reality of who we are as God's people. And in order for that to happen, we need to know the truth and be able to discern what is not true. We ended last week's text with the words of John. And this is how we know that he, that is God, lives in us. We know it by the spirit that he, gave, that he gave us. We are able to live confidently as the children of God because we know the spirit. Like Sarah said in the children's lesson, we may not see him, we may not hear him with an audible voice, but we feel God's presence in our heart. We hear his voice speaking to us either when we open the scriptures or as she said with the children, when we're praying and that that confirmation comes in our own lives. The Spirit is present. And so John makes a shift now in our text from all the hard words he's given us to now beginning halfway through his epistle, here is now how you need to be living as a child of God. And the first thing he says is test the spirits to determine which are from God and which are not. We're supposed to be discerning. The word actually means to, to look at something and determine if it is true and genuine or not, if it's authentic. We're to test the spirits, and then he gives us the test, like the piece of iron pyrite across the ceramic plate, what is true will be revealed. And the test he gives us is very simple. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. Why is this important? Well, very simply put, if you don't have the right Jesus, you don't have the right God. If you don't have the right Jesus, you don't have the right gospel. And if you don't have the gospel, then all is lost. And so it's very important that we understand the truth of who Jesus is as he has been revealed to us. And this is not the first time that this is an important issue. Back in the early 300s, the church was faced with a big crisis concerning who God was. There was an all-out attack on the divine nature of Jesus. The church met together, and you know what they came up with? The Nicene Creed, which is in our hymnal, which we use from time to time. 
That creed exists for one purpose, to expound the truth that Jesus is fully God who became a human being to save us from our sins. That is God's desire. That's the truth that God wants us to hold on to. It's the truth He's given to us. We live in a world where there is much confusion and where there are many views about God. And John wants us to be discerning. He wants us to be able to test the spirits. I mean, let's face it. There are those who deny the Trinity. There are those who deny the two natures of Jesus, His incarnation. There are those who even deny the resurrection. And yet they are religious in many ways. And not all their teachings sound bad. I mean, think about it. Buddhism and Hinduism don't want anything to do with Christianity. And yet there are a lot of people in our society that look to the teachings of Buddhism and Hinduism as a valid way to live your life. Not that they're worshiping what they worship, but their principles. They take them to heart and they live by them. And then there's Judaism and Islam and Mormons and Jehovah's Witness and Unitarians who don't want anything to do with the Jesus as he's revealed in the Bible. And how many of us have sent our kids off to school, off to university? where, generally speaking, the professors in the philosophy departments and the theology departments don't want anything to do with Jesus, who is God, who became a man. So what would John say to us? He would tell us to be careful. Don't let these people become your teachers. You need to hold on to the truth you have received and hold it on and take it to heart. Why? Because your salvation, And the salvation of the entire world depends on you holding on to this truth of who Jesus is. Now, some would say, what does it really matter? I mean, I believe in Jesus. I mean, isn't all that really matters is you believe in him? Okay, true. Who is Jesus to you? Who is he? Well, he was a great teacher. He he taught us everything about God and showed us how we should live our lives. He taught about Peace and love and patience and acceptance, those are all good teachings. But who is Jesus? Well, he was a spirit-filled man who lived the way that God wanted all of us to live. He lived and gave us an example of how to live. Well, true. That sounds good, doesn't it? But who is Jesus? Well, he's a prophet. God sent him into this world to proclaim his word, to reveal the truth to us. And we should listen to what he teaches. That sounds good too. But who is Jesus? A good person, a great teacher, a spirit-filled man, even a prophet, cannot die and give you forgiveness of your sins. Of all the gods, of all the religions, of all the world, the only one who's done that is Jesus Christ. He is the only one that can change your destiny from hell to heaven. And he's the only one that can change the destiny of the whole world and give them eternal life. And it all comes down to who is Jesus. Is he who the Bible declares him to be? Who was born in a manger in Bethlehem? Who was it that died on a cross? We know what the Bible says. Now, it's a mystery and it's hard to understand. That that little baby in a manger was absolutely 100% human being, just like you and I. But that he was also at the same time 100% eternal God at the same time. 100% man, 100% God. It's a mystery. It's beyond our ability to grasp. And yet, through faith, we hold on to that truth because that's what the Bible says. He is God in human flesh. And it is only when God goes to the cross and dies, that we can be assured of forgiveness. Jesus taught compassion. He taught love. He taught mercy. He taught acceptance and tolerance, but all within the bounds of his grace and mercy, which are found in and grounded in the cross and what it means. John then goes on. And he tells us why there are so many false teachings in the world. Why there are those who take the truth and twist it, take the air and twist it just enough that it sounds true. He tells us in our text, This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. 
They are from the world, therefore they speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. What is it that the world wants us to accept? What is it that we are so inclined to gravitate toward? Well, you might find this humorous. You might find it a little bit sobering, but I ran across something that I wanted to share with you. It is the devil's beatitudes. Okay? And the first time I read this, I was convicted. And I want you to see how many of these touch your heart. Blessed are those who are too tired, too busy, or too distracted to spend even one hour a week with their fellow Christians. They are my best workers. Blessed are those who wait to be asked and expect to be thanked. I can use them. Blessed are the touchy who stop going to church, for they are my missionaries. Blessed are the troublemakers, for they shall be called my children. Blessed are the complainers, for their complaining is music to my ears. Blessed are those who keep a list of the preacher's mistakes, for they get nothing out of his sermons. Blessed is the church member who expects to be invited to his own church, for he is part of the problem and not part of the solution. Blessed are those who gossip, for they shall cause strife and divisions which please me. Blessed are those who are easy, easily offended, for soon they get angry and quit. Blessed are those who do not, do not give an offering to support the mission of God, for in stealing from God, they steal for me. Blessed is he who professes love for God, but hates his brother and sister, for he shall be with me forever. And blessed are you when you hear these words and think the preacher's talking about someone else, because I've got you right where I want you. How many of those touched your heart? It did me. It's so easy to get sucked into the deceptions that are out there. You know, every person is, is created to be a spiritual being. And God wants and craves a relationship with us. And He did not send His Son into the world to save us from our sins so we could be led off into error. He wants us to know the truth. He wants us to stand solid and strong on the truth. And what is the truth that God wants you to know? First, that He loves you. He loves you and He wants you. And it was His great love for you that moved Him to send Jesus into this world in the first place and go to the cross and die to win for you the forgiveness of your sins. He wants you to know the truth that He has come to you in your baptism. When the water was poured over you, God reached out of eternity and claimed you and adopted you into his family and said, you are my child because I love you and I want you. And in your baptism, God claimed you. He wants you to know the truth that when you come here today and every time we have the Lord's Supper, when you approach the altar, that what happened 2,000 years ago is real for you today because Christ comes to be present with you because he wants you. He wants you to know His grace is for you today. He's not only with you, but He's surrounding you and shoring you up from behind as He leads you because He's never going to forsake you. Everything God has done is so that He can convince you that He wants you with Him in heaven forever. That's why He's so concerned that we protect the faith that He's entrusted to us in our hearts and not let us be deceived and led astray, but to hold on to the truth. So how do you do that? Well, I got two simple ways. First, we need to know the Bible. We need to be able to take the scriptures in hand and know what they say. Maybe that should one be, would be one of the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who think they know the Word of God because they really know nothing. Maybe we need to take the Word of God in hand and learn it so that when we hear something that is an error, we recognize it. He has put His Spirit in our hearts. How many times have you heard something and you just felt, that doesn't sound exactly right? That is the Spirit of God crying out in your heart to help you hold on to the truth and protect your faith. But He can only do that if you know it. So know your Scriptures. Know the Bible. And secondly, never allow yourself to be influenced by someone who is not a believer. G. Campbell Morgan, the great preacher of a century ago, was once told, preachers need to catch the spirit of this age. He said, God forgive them if they do that. The preacher 
Spirit's job is to convict the spirit of this age. We are to be different. We are those who know the truth. We are those who live with the assurance of the truth and make the truth known to the world. And why is it important? Because your salvation depends upon it and the salvation of every single person you love. Amen. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord, and the life everlasting, depart in peace. Amen.